And you know, um, this is Super Bowl Sunday for the Christian. Matter of fact, it's more than, this is a Super Bowl party after we won the game. <laughs> and uh, for Christians, that's true because this is the day that makes Christianity stand out from all other religions. Did you know that there were 4,200 religions? I shouldn't say were. There are 4,200 religions in existence today in the world. But only one empty tomb. That causes Christianity to be unique from all the rest. Matter of fact, of those 4,200, three quarters of the world are a part of one of five major religions. Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. The leaders of those groups, Buddhism, Buddha, Hinduism, Brahman, Judaism, the main spokesman prophet, Moses, Islam, Muhammad, and Christianity, Jesus Christ. And only one of those, now we're going down from 4,200, to five major ones, and of those five leaders, only one of them claimed that he would be raised from the dead, actually was raised from the dead, and then came back and gave convincing proofs that he really was raised from the dead, and that was Jesus Christ. You see, Christianity, amen, Christianity stands or falls on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen to what John Stott said about this. Christianity is in its very essence a resurrection religion. The concept of resurrection lies at its heart. If you remove it, Christianity is destroyed. Matter of fact, the Bible says it even stronger than that. Look at this passage here in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul was saying this, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching, that's what I'm doing this morning, our preaching is in vain, that's empty, useless, that means. Your faith, every person that says, I believe in Jesus, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, your faith is useless, it's in vain. He goes on to say, it's worthless and you're still in your sins. And if we have hoped in Christ in this life only and not for a resurrection, brothers and sisters, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, this is what the scripture says, we of all men and women be most pitied because we're believing a lie. We have hope in a lie. But here's the reality. We're believing a real historical event where there's evidence and proofs that it happened. Therefore, we rejoice and our lives have been transformed like never before. You know, um, a man named Thomas Arnold, actually a professor at Oxford of modern history says there is no event in history that has been more proved than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen to what he says. No one fact in the history of mankind is proved by better and fuller evidence of every sort than the fact that Christ died and was rose from the dead. I love what J. Warner Walker says. He's a cold case detective and atheist, at least before he encountered the facts of Jesus. And this is what he said. I'm not a Christian because it works for me. I had a life prior to Christianity that seemed to be working just fine. And my life as a Christian hasn't always been easy. I'm a Christian because it's true. I'm a Christian because I want to live a way that reflects the truth. I'm a Christian because my high regard for the truth leaves me no alternative. Now guys, that's strong words by a cold case detective who was an atheist Then, when he was confronted with the evidence said the evidence demands that I believe in Jesus. You know, there's been many people who've been hostile to the faith of Christianity. 
hostile to Jesus Christ down the years. And when they have faced the evidence head on, many have been converted to Jesus Christ. And you know, when they did it, they said, we have to attack the resurrection because they understood that if the resurrection falls, you pull that piece out, guess what? All the rest of Christianity falls with it. In fact, two of those guys, one guy's name was Josh McDowell. Josh was a college student studying to be a lawyer. He had a bunch of Christian friends that kept on bugging him about their, his need to trust Jesus. So Josh had an assignment in one of his classes and what he decided to do was write an essay that would disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Therefore, he could shut up his Christian friends. In the process, Josh was so convinced about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the real uh, reality of it. And he approached it like a lawyer, circumstantial evidence, look at all the evidence I can find. And when he was done, he became a radical convert and follower of Jesus that actually wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Lee Strobel. Now, Lee Strobel's situation, he was actually a journalist for the Chicago Tribune. And his wife became a believer in Jesus. And so he said, you know what? My wife's into a bunch of fairy tales. She's going down some crazy street here. I'm gonna prove to her that this Christianity is false. And so like an investigative journalist, as an atheist, he attacked the evidence, and when he was done, his life was transformed, converted to Christ. Since then, has been a spokesman for Jesus and the resurrection of Christ ever since. Both these guys wrote books. Matter of fact, the first one, More Than a Carpenter, by Josh McDowell summarizes, he's got this big thick book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict, but this is a simple little story of how he came to Christ and uh, some of the evidence that's in there. Lee Strobel wrote the book, The Case for Christ. Again, there's a much bigger book on it, but this is a smaller one. And if you're really interested, and by the way, I don't know if you picked up when you entered, I hope you did. Uh, we had these flyers here, they'll give you a little taste, you can look at uh, some of the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, we have a limited number of these books we're just giving away. You can go to the welcome desk afterwards. I ask only if you're really investigating and looking uh, and you'd like to know more today. We have these books for you for free and we ask you that you would pick one up because you need to see the evidence for yourself. You see, my goal this morning Evidence is like this, and I got to tell you, it's from people that are a lot smarter than me. <laughs> I mean, these, these, these are some big people with big brains. I'm just one of the normal guys. And um, so I've studied a lot of them, seen what they've said, learned, but th th there's a lot of evidence out there. Today, my goal is to try to present to you just a small tasting of some of the evidence that's there to prove that Jesus really did raise from the dead so that you might also be confronted with the reality, this is evidence that demands a decision that I must make. So this morning, I'm gonna share with you three different evidences regarding the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the first one has to do with the historical records, the Bible. Why is that? Well, where do we learn about the resurrection of Jesus? From the Bible. <laughs> and so now the first question I gotta ask myself, is this book reliable? As a matter of fact, not only is, it, uh, is the book reliable, it claims that it was a historical event, not just a fable, not just a spiritual picture to learn lessons about how to live life, this book claims that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was an actual historical event. So there's people, and I'm gonna tell you, they're both friends of the Bible and of Jesus and they're foes of the Bible and Jesus. And there's people who are followers of Jesus and not followers of Jesus that have investigated this book. Matter of fact, there's an there's a area of study called textual, textual criticism. And what they do is they take all the books of antiquity 
And they look at them and they test them to say, how reliable are these books? And so there's been no book that has had more deeper scrutiny than the Bible to see if what it says is reliable and accurate. And when the results are in, the outcome is, is that in antiquity, actually the Bible is the most reliable book that's available to us. Now, I'm not gonna go into it a lot more today. I did two messages on this last fall. If you're visiting with us, say, I wanna hear more about that. You go to our next step table, give them your name and information. We'll see to it, we'll get that to you. But uh, today, I just wanna give you a sampling and a taste of this. But this book has been studied by people that reject the book, reject Jesus, hostile to him. But when they come away, they say, you know, we gotta admit, the book is reliable. You can trust what it says. Luke said this. Luke is one of the authors of the book of Luke as well as the book of Acts. Uh, Luke said this. It seemed fitting to me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning. You know, he's writing, he's talking about Jesus. As a matter of fact, in the context, you see he's even talked to eyewitnesses that claim they saw these things. He says, I want you to know that I've investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that you've been taught about Jesus. So Luke claimed that. Now there's a man whose name was Sir William Ramsey. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He was an archeologist, actually Nobel Prize winner. He dedicated 15 years of his life. This, like I said, these people have bigger brain than me. Nobel Prize winner, archaeologist. Matter of fact, this archaeologist was so good, they actually knighted him for his work in Scotland. And so he spent 15 years with the goal of disproving the credentials of Luke as a historian and seeking to prove that the Bible is not a reliable document. And this was the results of his findings. Luke is a historian of the first rank. This author should be placed along with the very greatest of historians. Now guys, are you hearing me? This is, this is a Nobel Prize winner, archeologist who was knighted, he's that good. He came hostile against Jesus and this book spent 15 years to prove that it isn't reliable and Luke can't be trusted. He came away not only convinced that the book is reliable, that Luke has got great credentials like nobody else, he was radically converted to Jesus Christ because of the evidence. Brothers and sisters, this is evidence that demands a verdict. It really does when you are honest with what's going on. A man named Josephus recorded the events of the resurrection outside, you know, this isn't the Bible. This was a historian in the first century. He was a Roman Jewish historian. He was a Jewish man himself, but not a follower of Jesus. Now again, first century, close to the events. And he recorded the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen to what he said. Now there was about this time Jesus. He was the Christ. And when Pilate had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day. As the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you stuff that people aren't, who aren't like me, who aren't preachers, who aren't followers of you know, Jesus, are saying about Jesus and his resurrection and the evidence. So that's the first piece of evidence. This book is the most reliable book in antiquity regarding his, the history and the words that it says. Now, the second evidence is this. The eyewitnesses in Jerusalem. Let me tell you why I say that. The resurrection took place in the city of Jerusalem. It was preached some 50 days after it happened right there in Jerusalem. And anybody 
and there were many hostile at that time and that were trying to cover it up, could have gone to the tomb themselves and disproved that it was empty. Because you understand, we think of Jerusalem, we think of a city like Chicago, we think of a big city. You want to know how big Jerusalem was at the time of Jesus? Smaller than Palos Heights. One square mile with 25,000 people living in it. You know what? Could have had a preacher that morning, one of the apostles saying, Jesus rose from the dead. They could have just walked over there right after the service and said, let me go see that tomb. That's the reality of the importance of the witnesses right there in Jerusalem, right in the place where Jesus was crucified and buried and rose again. Talks about the eyewitnesses in the Bible in 1 Corinthians. Says this, first of all. He was raised, this was Paul writing, speaking, he was raised on the third day according to scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. First thing I want to point out is he, you know, there were Cephas was Peter, but I want to speak about the 12 for a second because we need to understand this about the 12. These are people who were martyred Of the 12, 11 of them ended up being killed for preaching and testifying about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The one who didn't ended up exiled and imprisoned the rest of his life after they tried to kill him and uh, failed at it. They they sent him to the island of Patmos just off of the west side of Turkey. And these 12 men spent their years proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus under persecution, under imprisonment, under beatings. And here's the reality. Nobody's going to die for something they know is a lie. They're only going to die for something they know is true. They're not going to get beat and thrown at and say, okay, whoa, I back off. (laughs) Their life and their testimony is proof that Jesus rose. Listen, Listen to what Chuck Colson said. Many of you know Chuck Colson from the um, Watergate, I'm gonna wait till it's up here. I'm not sure you can see that because I can't see it, but I'm gonna read to you what I can see so you can hear it. I know the resurrection is a fact and Watergate proved it to me. Now this is Chuck Colson, we're at the heart of Watergate. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed the truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three months. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. The evidence demands a verdict. But let's look at some of the others that, uh, that Jesus appeared to. After he appeared to Peter, to the 12, he also appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. Then look, note what he says. Most of them remain until now. You know what he's saying here in a sense? Like if I was saying to you, you know, he appeared to like 300 people here at Moraine today. You know what you're going to do after a package's done? You're going to, he's like saying, go ask them. If you don't believe me, go ask them because they're still alive. You can go check out what I said and you can check with these people. Jesus has risen from the dead. Others can tell you because they saw it with their own eyes. Then it says this. Then he appeared to James. Why is James crucial? Because James was Jesus' half-brother in the flesh. And when you read the historical records, we find out that Jesus' own family didn't believe in him before he was raised from the dead. Matter of fact, in one portion of Scripture, they, they said, our brother's lost his mind. It's like saying, you know, my brother Jesus, he's crazy. That's what James thought of him. But after seeing the resurrected Jesus... James' whole life changed. He became a follower and a leader in the church of Jesus Christ. And then finally we have Paul himself. He appeared to me also. 
Why is that significant? Because anybody that knows the story of Paul, as we look at these historical records, we find out he was a man who persecuted the church. People who said that Jesus rose from the dead, he dedicated his life to chasing them down, to have them beaten in prison. And once Paul encountered the resurrected Jesus, his life was turned upside down. He was transformed. So the second thing we have is evidence, just again, a small tasting of it, is the fact that the eyewitnesses right there in Jerusalem testified to the fact, and nobody's ever come forward with any records to say that somebody has disproved or said what they said was not true. And the final reason is this, transform lives. The 12 are the greatest example of it. I mean, you know, I just told you what they've all endured for the sake of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and proclaiming that message. We need to know just like about five or six weeks before that, they're the same ones who deserted Jesus when trouble came. They're the same ones who denied they even knew him to save their own skin. They're the same ones that after he died, they went and gathered together at a house, were all discouraged and sitting there depressed because Jesus had died. But once they encountered the resurrected Jesus, their lives were turned upside down. And then we heard, as we've already heard already, they spent the rest of their lives, even to the point to be killed for it, testifying to the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. And there have been lives down through history who have encountered the Jesus who's still alive, the resurrected Christ where he has encountered, I'm not talking about a personal vision of the resurrection, but because he's alive, he's still working in the world today and lives have been turned upside down. And today I want you to hear a story of one. Gary, would you come up here, good brother? And uh, Gary's gonna share the story about how Jesus has encountered him and, and changed his life. The testimonies keep going on about the resurrection of Jesus. Thanks, Gary. Well, good morning. He's alive. That's right. You know, I'm going to ask you to do uh, three things this morning. I'm going to ask you to listen to my story. I'm going to ask you to listen to some good news. And then I'm going to ask you to respond to that good news this morning. When you walked in, you got a, uh, one of those leaflets that Pat talked about. And you also got a response card that says, my response. And there's four possibilities for a response on that card. I trusted Jesus today. That would be a good one. I rededicated my life to Jesus today. I have questions. I want to grow in my relationship with Jesus. Those are good things. So let me just tell you a little bit about my story and how Jesus cut across my life. I was born on the north side of Chicago, actually just a couple blocks from Wrigley Field. And then when I was two, my parents moved to the south side of Chicago. You know, as, as a kid growing up, I loved being outdoors, I loved playing sports, I loved doing all that stuff, and I actually dreamed of this one day playing second base for the Chicago White Sox. I actually dreamed about that. But then the reality set in, and I was mediocre at best at hitting and fielding, so the dream was gone. My parents, I grew up in a very loving home, and my parents, one of the things that they did because they loved me was they decided that they would send me to church. They didn't take me to church, but they sent me to church. I had a brother, I got a sister, and they sent the three of us to uh, Sunday school and church together. And they felt that it was important that when I was in seventh grade that I be enrolled in confirmation classes. So the memories are vivid for me. It's like it was yesterday. 
I can remember sitting at the kitchen table on Friday night with my mom, taking my textbook, finding the answer in the textbook to the question in the workbook, and transferring the answer over into the workbook, but something was amiss. It never went through here. It just went from a textbook to a workbook, and I learned facts and information that I never embraced. But here's something that was really crazy about that whole time. I can remember always believing that Jesus is God. Never doubted that. I can always remember believing the Bible to be the word of God. I never doubted that. But I got to tell you something. It made no, no difference to me. I didn't understand why in the world would somebody take and put on a cross somebody who had never done anything wrong. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't see it. Why in the world would they do that to Jesus? So, seventh grade, eighth grade, I go through confirmation classes. On May 19th, 1963, I was confirmed. I received my confirmation in the faith, right? I had the right answers in the right places but that's all I had was I had information that I transferred from one book to another. It made no difference in who I was. And you say, how do you know it was 1963 on May 19th? I've got my confirmation Bible in my office. The outside of that Bible is destroyed because it sat in a drawer in my desk all those years, and the inside is pristine. Today I've got Bibles. The insides are worn out, pages fallen out, outside ruined, but it's not from sitting around, it's from being used. And so 1963, when I, when I was confirmed, that Sunday when I got my confirmation Bible, that was the last Sunday I was ever in church. I went and I began to live life in high school. And by the time I was a junior, senior in high school, I was dabbling with alcohol and involving myself in sensual relationships with young women. That's who I was. When I was in high school, it was in the uh, mid to late 60s. And if you remember the mid to late 60s, it was a very volatile time. There was a lot of racial tension and strife. And I was a guy who was very prejudiced against people that were not like me. That's who I am. That's who I was. That was 19, in the mid 1960s. I graduated high school and I went into the Air Force in 1969. And it was while I was in the Air Force, this whole thing about Jesus was going to come up again. But I got to be honest with you, I, w I wasn't looking for God at all. I was too busy putting my life together the way I wanted to do it. And so in 1969, when I joined the Air Force, the use of alcohol became uh, more prevalent in my life. I got to look back and I got to tell you, I, I don't think I was ever an alcoholic but I sure could binge drink with the best of them. And so by the time I got stationed on the island of Guam in 1970, I was moving along at a pretty good clip and things had taken a real south turn in my life. And I was involved in all those things at a deeper level until one day when a guy walked into the day room, I'm in the middle of a poker game. I think it was the only winning hand I ever had. And he walks in the day room, I'm sitting there with all my buddies, and he looks at me and he says, have you talked to Jesus today? I know what I said to him. I won't say it here. But I made a smart comment to him. 
And all my friends laughed. The guy didn't say a word. He turned around, walked out of the day room, never saw him again. But this is what came, I came away with at that time. He was the first guy ever to say to me, you can talk to Jesus personally. You know what? Made no difference to me. I get out of the Air Force in December of 1972, and I begin to go to Moraine Valley Community College in January of 73. And it was there that I met a young woman. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but she was going to have a deep impact in my life. And one of the things that I did was I began to date her. And I thought, you know, I know that she and her family go to a church on Sunday morning. I think I'd like to go with her. But I wasn't looking for Jesus. I was looking to spend more time with her. And it happened that when I went to that church on that first Sunday that I went there, I heard what I know now know to be the gospel. And Pat alluded to it already. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. The apostle Paul says, I delivered to you that which is of first importance, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised the third day, according to the scriptures. I'd like to tell you that I embraced that the moment that I heard it, but I'd be lying to you. I left the church. I couldn't wait to get out of the church. I, it, it was actually here at Moraine Valley Church down in the chapel. I was sitting five rows back from the front on the end of the row because I wanted to get out quick. And when I heard the gospel for the first time, it scared me because it confronted me. It confronted me with sin because nobody had to convince me that I had sinned. I was fully aware of that. So fast forward two years. I kept going with this woman. She's now my wife. I kept going to church with her and I kept hearing and I kept seeing the difference that Jesus could make in somebody's life. And it was at dinner one evening at our kitchen table, a card table and four chairs, that I looked at my wife and I said, how do I get what you have? You have something I don't have. She looked at me and she said, Gary, some years ago when I was younger, I trusted Jesus as my savior. When I met her, she wasn't walking with Jesus. And she said, I've just recently rededicated my life to Jesus. And what you're seeing is the difference he can make. I said, how do I get it? She said, you need to admit to God that you've sinned against him. Believe that Jesus is God and that he died for your sin and rose from the dead. And invite him to come into your life to forgive your sin and to have relationship with him in that way. That's a step of faith, right? To actually believe that for yourself. It's like the faith that you expressed this morning when you sat down in those chairs. That chair was designed to support you and what you're doing is you're resting in that. And that's basically what my sweetheart told me was you need to rest in who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Do you know what I did when I heard that? I stopped right there and I said, Jesus, I know that I have sinned against you. I've been a man who's been prejudiced. I've been a man who has uh, been drunk many times. I've been a man who has been involved in promiscuous relationships. That's who I am. I, I know my sin, 
and I admit it to you. And I believe, I believe that you died for me. I'd been hearing it for two years, and I finally came to the place where I said, you know what, Jesus, you did that for me. And I thanked him for that exchange of life. Do you know what the scripture says? That he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The bad news is for us that all of us have sinned and all of us fall short of the glory of God and that the wages of the sin that we do creates distance between us and God. As a matter of fact, it says the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus the Lord. So my question for you this morning, maybe my story resonates with you a little bit. Maybe you see yourself there. Maybe you recognize that you indeed have sinned against God and that because of your sin, you're spiritually dead before him. There's nothing that you can do to please him, but we spend so much of our time trying to do things that will please God when in reality that's an exercise in vain religion. What God did on the other hand was he sent his only begotten son to a cross so that whoever would believe on him would not perish but have eternal life. And that when a person places their confidence in that finished work on the cross, the death the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, they can come into a relationship so that when the Father in heaven looks at them, they see Jesus rather than their sin. And when the Father looked on Jesus at the cross, do you know what he saw? He saw you and me. Jesus had taken on our sin so that we could have his righteousness. Now, I have no idea where I'm at as far as my notes go. I know. But see, here's the reality. Nobody needs to convince us that we put the cart in the ditch, right? We all know that we've sinned. We all know that we've done that. There's nobody that needs to convince us of that. That's the convicting work of the Holy Spirit who says, yes, you've put the cart in the ditch, you've sinned, and you stand condemned before God unless you receive Jesus. That's a hard truth, but it's truth nonetheless. That's bad news. But the good news is this, that Jesus has come that you and I might have life and that life would be in his name. The scripture says, all who call on in the name of the Lord will be saved. And you might be like I was. You might be wondering, how do I get that for myself? The reality is everybody in here knows that they need Jesus. It's as simple as ABC. Admit that you've sinned against God. The scripture says all have sinned. We're part of that all. We need to believe in our heart that Jesus is God, that he died for my sin, and he rose from the dead so I could have forgiveness of my sin and eternal life all as a gift. The scripture says it's with the heart that man believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth, he confesses Jesus, resulting in salvation. You and I need that as a gift. And when a person calls out on Jesus and invites him into their life, they become a brand new creature in Christ 
Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God so that no one can boast. See, Jesus did all the heavy lifting. He did the hard work. He did the work to pay for your sin and for mine. He took your sin as far away as the east is from the west. He took it to the grave and left it there. And then he rose victoriously over the grave. He took the greatest obstacle that you'll ever face out of the way so you could have peace with God and eternal life all as a gift. Now, you can know all of that and still be a dead man. I was. It wasn't until I came to that place where I recognized that Jesus had done all of that for me and I triggered it by just saying, reaching out, telling Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. And in the best way I knew how, I just invited him to come in to forgive my sin and take over the leadership of my life. So we're right at that spot right now where you're here and you're sensing a nudge in your own spirit. You're sensing that God is speaking to you about your own need for Jesus. Maybe you're without God and without hope in the world, and today is the day of salvation for you. My encouragement to you, actually God's encouragement to you, is don't put it off. If you sense the Spirit of God speaking to you right now, you say yes to Jesus, I want your forgiveness, and I invite you into my life, and I do it right now. Would you do that right now? Would you ask Jesus to come into your life and make you a brand new person? What he did, he did just for you. The scripture says this, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, has eternal life. Not will have, but has eternal life and will not come into judgment but has path out of death into life. See, when Jesus died on that cross and went to the grave, he paid your death penalty. And he took death off the table for you so that you could have life in his name. That's what Jesus did. The God-man came to suffer and die and to go to the grave and then rise from the dead so you and I could experience forgiveness of sin and have eternal life. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, you know what? I'm a believer in Jesus, but I've been living below my capacity. I've been doing things my way. I've been putting life together the way I want. I know Jesus, and I know I'm secure in his love for me, but he hasn't been on display in my life. Today is the day for you to come and say, you know what, Lord? I want it to be different from here. That's what became evident to me when I saw my wife, the change that Jesus brought in her when she rededicated her life to Christ. That was a deep impact in me. It was transformative. Maybe that's you this morning. And you say, I need that, Jesus. I need that fresh work of the Holy Spirit. It's near you haven't lost relationship but you're living below capacity and God says, I want you to live differently. Today's that day for you. Maybe you're a person that says, you know what? I've got questions. I hear what you say, but this is all fresh to me and I've got questions about this. That's legitimate. 
Today's a day for you to just make that aware to somebody around you. You've got that card that you received when you came in this morning. The fourth one is, hey, you know what? I know Jesus. I'm walking with Jesus. Sure, I've got questions, but I want to grow in my relationship with Jesus. This is the moment for you, for each and every one of us in here to fill that card out. Take a moment and do that. Grab that card. Everybody's going to fill one out. Put your information on there, your name, your phone number, your email, whatever's required on there, and then record what your response is. Now, here's what I'm going to ask you to do if you've trusted Jesus as your Savior this morning. Just right where you're sitting, I want you to raise your hand. This is important. It's important that you know, and it's important that we know that you've trusted Jesus. So would you do that? If you've trusted Jesus this morning, would you raise your hand? You've trusted him the first time. Raise your hand. Maybe you're rededicating your life to Jesus this morning. Would you raise your hand? And what I'm going to ask you to do after we worship a little bit more, I want you to, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning, I want you to fill that card out. And I want you to bring it down to the front here. There's going to be people here that would be ready and willing to meet with you, to pray with you, and to rejoice over new life in Christ. If you're rededicating your life to Christ, we want you to come forward with those cards as well. We've got a booklet that we want to make available to you to help you take your first step in walking with Jesus. Scripture says this. This is one of my favorite passages. It's 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5. It simply says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith. Through faith in what? Faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is coming again. And he's coming for you. He's coming for you if you know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, you will be left behind. Today, as Paul would say, is the day of salvation. Right now is the acceptable time. Don't put it off. Trust Jesus.